Initiatives Conference. Um, this is funded by our uh, grant from the Arthur Bonning Davis Foundation to support new initiatives in international education at Millsaps College. Um, I want to open by recognizing um, in the room some of the key people who have supported this program. First, I'm wondering if our student fellows would please raise their hands. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, we've had a, a, a good year together. Uh, we did a seminar together in the fall, and you'll be meeting them individually as they give their presentations for our conference today. Um, also, I want to recognize um, the faculty members who have been a part of the committee supporting IPP, and that would be uh, Dr. George Bay, who is in the back of the room. Uh, also, our director, uh, Molly West, who is uh, down here, and in charge of all logistics from, um, for the international students, our campus international student advisor, Kay Mortimer, who has um, done everything uh, in the background to make this conference possible. So thank you to Kay and Molly and, and George. I'd like to introduce our speaker now um, for the keynote talk of the conference. Um, this is uh, Professor Clark Miller. He's from Arizona State University, uh, where he is a uh, professor in uh, his, his official title as Professor and Associate Director for Faculty, in other words, for Faculty uh, Development in the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. Uh, Clark is originally trained as an engineer at University of Illinois. Uh, he went on to do his PhD in engineering at Cornell, uh, which is where I met him. Um, he, we were together in the Science and Technology Studies program at Cornell in the mid-1990s. Uh, Clark specializes in teaching about and doing research on the sociology and politics of transitions in energy systems and innovation. And uh, he is going to be speaking with us today for a little while, and then we'll take some questions when he's done. So, with no further ado, Clark. Thank you, Uh, great to be here. I, uh, let me just switch this over here and hopefully that works. Um, I'm really looking forward to the next two days and the opportunity to talk with all of you about all different kinds of aspects of uh, climate change, energy transitions, uh, and the future. Um, I spent the first three days of this week uh, with an international group of folks trying to figure out how we can bring off-grid renewable energy solutions uh, to parts of the world that don't currently have electricity. I think maybe not a lot of people know that one in seven people on the planet have no access to electricity uh, in their homes. Uh, and so <coughs> um, we're working on trying to find a variety of uh, of ways that we can address that problem through energy innovation. It's one of many different kinds of approaches. The thing about energy innovation that, that we're grappling with. And so what I want to talk to you today about is how we kind of think about the future that we are moving towards uh, as a design problem. Um, climate change, uh, for better and worse, and we can talk about this uh, in the Q&A if you want to talk about it. I'm not going to try to make the uh, case here. Uh, is uh, an incredibly disruptive uh, force. I think about it uh, as being on par in some respects with things like uh, the American Revolution, uh, the in invention of electricity in the late 19th century. Uh, in terms of its uh, power, not as we normally think about kind of the power of climate change as a disruptive force, right? The physical power of nature, although that's 
obviously an integral part of what's going on, uh, but as a disruptive idea. An idea that changes how we think about ourselves, how we think about our relationship with one another, both inside the United States and around the world, how we think about our relationships uh, with the planet, such that we begin to think about what it means to do things differently. And so the case I want to make uh, today is that that challenge that's posed to us is a challenge uh, to invent a different kind of world. Uh, that is an invention process that is well underway. I'll talk a little bit about that, that reinvention process. Uh, well underway, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go along, uh, such that ultimately I want to so to make the pitch that it's the human responses to climate change that will be as powerful a force in human history going forward as anything that nature does in this conversation we're having with her uh, about carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, and so the question in front of us is what kind of a future do we want to build? This is not a future that is foreordained for us. It is a design problem, and I want to set out for you today some of the parameters uh, of that design problem and just kind of open up this space as a space for us to think about uh, because we don't often think about it in these terms. So to start, I want to take you back a little bit in history, about half a century, uh, to a children's author. Some of you may be familiar with the work of uh, Richard Scarry. He wrote books like What Do People Do All Day? Cars and Trucks and Things That Go. These are children's books. Um, incredibly powerful children's books in the sense that not only did I read them and and they're probably the only children's books that I remember reading as a child I'm sure I read gazillions more but these are the ones that I remember and now I of course have read them to my nine-year-old and for a period from about three to five virtually every night right so if you think about the power of a set of ideas to cultivate imagination, right? These are a set of books that are being read to children nightly over and over and over again when they're in this incredibly formative period of their lives around the ages of three, four, five, six, right? So think about that with, as, you, as you look at these images. And of course, he's writing in a period in human history, American history, where we've just gone through. He's writing in the 50s. We've just gone through these decades of transformation that have brought electrification to America, that brought energy to America. Uh, and the last bits of that transformation are still happening in the 50s. Remember, the Rural Electrification Administration is a program of the Great Depression, right? Before the Rural Electrification Act, only one in 10 farms in America was electrified. By the 50s, we're pushing, you know, most of them being electrified. Puerto Rico, which has been in the news recently uh, because of Hurricane Maria, the vast majority of the island of Puerto Rico was electrified in the late 1950s through the Rural Electrification Administration, right? And so this new technology, the way that people are responding to this new technology is transforming the landscape of society. And so we're you know, leveling bumpy roads to make them smooth with bulldozers. Uh, of course, you know, this is in the service of a kind of civilizing mission, if you will 
that kind of language about the frontier is still part and parcel of how America thought about itself. Uh, we're in the midst in the 50s of the consumer revolution, the scaling of production and manufacturing in this country, the transformation of us from a rural countryside into an industrial powerhouse. That's why I'm not supposed to step on that. It's very clear. We're inventing new systems to move people and stuff around the planet on scales never before imagined that today we take for granted. Right? I flew here from Phoenix last night after I taught two classes, right? We just take for granted that that airplane is going to be there. It's going to move us. Not in the 50s, right? This was just being put into place, uh, these air transportation systems. Uh, the Colorado Plateau in the 1950s was being colonized in a material sense uh, in that on the Colorado Plateau in the 1950s and early 60s, we built 27 enormous multi-gigawatt coal-fired power plants powered from coal mines on the Colorado Plateau. And we ran transmission lines out to Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Denver, <laughs> Seattle, San Francisco, right, to power the Western United States. This is happening uh, in this time period. And of course, what we're doing at the same time as we're building these enormous new infrastructures is we're also rebuilding our lives, right? And so you can see in this house, the electrical infrastructure bolted onto the wall, right? Which is how they originally did it. And then they put it behind the walls, right? But we're getting vacuums, cleaners, and televisions, and all of these electrical devices in our houses that have now taken over our lives completely and entirely. So that we're changing what it means to live on a day-to-day -day basis at the same time that we're structuring our infrastructural landscapes. Um, there's a saying about the American electrical grid that I hear talking to utility executives and, and others today. We have the best grid infrastructure in the United States that was built in 1947. <laughs> right, so this infrastructure is now aging and of course that aging infrastructure and the lack of reinvestment in that infrastructure is part and parcel of the story of Puerto Rico and why, for example, today parts of that, significant parts of that island are still in the midst of the longest blackout in American history by months. And of course this pattern continues, right? We all have our devices that are changing our lives, our iPhones and our Samsungs and our Huawei's, but behind those devices we have this massive new infrastructure. Uh, this is a new Apple data center built in East Mesa, in a suburb of Phoenix, uh, that was just built a couple of years ago, <coughs> that powers, in this sense, in a data sense, not in an energy sense, that ability of us to communicate and to compute with our phones. It powers Siri's voice to talk to us, right? So that this idea. Uh, is we are, we are still building the world in the same sort of way, which is we're building infrastructures, and at the same time we're building our day-to-day -day practices, right? Our lived realities as human beings. <coughs> so with that brief sort of thought experiment in sort of a, of history, right? I want to highlight and get back to this question of designing the future, um, that we are on the cusp 
of a new era in energy infrastructure, represented obviously by the sun. Um, this is from a report from about a month ago from the consulting company McKinsey. Some of you may know McKinsey, they are one of the world's largest consulting firms. Their clients are every conceivable multinational firm that you can imagine. This is what they're telling their clients today about the future of energy. Between now and 2050, 64% of all new energy facilities and infrastructure built on the planet, they are telling their clients will be solar energy facilities. Another 18% wind, making 82% of all new energy infrastructure built, renewable energy infrastructure built. We look out at the fraction of renewables today in America and elsewhere, if you include all the dams that we built between 1900 and 1965, <coughs> it's about 18%. But if you just look at solar and wind, it's still around 2 and 3%. And people say, we're not making any changes. Well, we've made significant changes in people's minds. And those changes in their minds and the changes in the technologies, and I'll show you the changes in the prices of those technologies, I'll show you that in a minute, right, are changing the way people think about the kinds of energy infrastructure that we're going to build uh, going forward. And McKenzie's not the only ones uh, who will tell you this. <coughs> I told Bill I wouldn't digress, but I got to digress for one. Um, <laughs> Bloomberg New Energy Finance, uh, their last international meeting talking about the future of energy, showed a series of graphs for each year for the last 10 years. And on those graphs, they showed how much solar energy was predicted to be built the following year, and then how much energy was actually built solar energy was built the next year. And every year, those predictions were behind the curve. Every year, people built more renewable energy than anybody thought that they would build the year before. Here's another piece of this. This is uh, from that same report. <laughs> By 2050, McKinsey is estimating that electric vehicles will represent 67 to 90 percent of all new passenger and commercial vehicles sold worldwide. <coughs> Within the last 18 months, half countries representing half the world's population have put in place policy goals, India, China, France, Great Britain, that after 2040, there will be no internal combustion engines sold in those countries after 2040. Why did they do that? Well, partly it's climate change, but partly they also know that history I was telling you. <coughs> In 1926, Ford Motor Company made half the vehicles sold in the world. That's why America won the 20th century. That industrial powerhouse that was automobile manufacturing. These countries want to win the automobile manufacturing war of the second half of the 21st century. And so they're telling their automot automobile industries now be ready for 2040, because if you can sell the best electric vehicle in China, India, France, Britain in 2040, you will win the sale of automobiles in this country after that date. So 
So what's happened in America as a result of those declarations? In the last 12 months, General Motors and Ford have both announced that within the next three years, they will build at least 25 electric vehicle lines within the next three years. Both companies. Right? So we're seeing rapid changes in the imagination of how the future will play out going forward. Here's part, part of the reason why. This is the simple reason why. There's more complicated reasons why. The, the, again, we're back to McKinsey's data from December. This is Britain, not America, Britain. Gas prices are somewhat higher. Natural gas prices are somewhat higher in Britain than they are in the United, in the United States. 2015, 2020, 2030. This is the relative price of electricity estimated in these going forward from different sources. So already what you can see is as of 2015, the cheapest form of electricity in Britain was to build new onshore wind fired power plants. Cheaper than running existing fossil fuel fired power plants. And by 2030, the three cheapest forms will be new onshore wind, new solar, and new offshore wind. I don't know if you have, any of you have ever been to Britain. They don't get any sunlight. <laughs> It's not Arizona. <laughs> if you plotted this for Arizona, you would be pretty close to today having new solar build be the cheapest form of electricity that you could produce. <laughs> this means it's cheaper, they're estimating in 2030, to build a new solar power plant in Britain than to run your existing combined cycle natural gas turbine power plant. This is how fast prices are changing in the renewable energy uh, sector. So this rapid transformation raises four profound questions. <coughs> Who is vulnerable to these changes? We know one answer. Even within the fossil fuel sector, this is the tip of the iceberg. You go to Washington DC and walk around the airport or, or the metro system and there you will see giant wall-sized posters that will tell you nine million people in this country work for the fossil fuel industry. They want Congress to know how big a deal this coming change is, right? So how do we act proactively <clears throat> to address the changes that are coming in our economic landscapes and I'll also argue in our social landscapes? <coughs> We have tended to have an attitude in this country that technology disruption is a good thing and that we should just let it happen. And we should not prepare for it in any way, shape, or form. I tried to talk to folks from an organization called the Delta Regional Authority. Some of you may know who that is, it's a federal state partnership to provide economic development solutions for the poorest 200 counties along the Mississippi River. They did not want to talk about the implications of these kinds of challenges for those counties. And I understand the politics of that. I've been doing climate and energy politics for the last 25 years. I've lived through this. 
I understand those politics, but we need to be anticipatory in terms of understanding the kinds of challenges that are coming forward for our communities and to take action to try to create futures that those folks will thrive in. We are dealing with this problem also in Arizona. We are in 2019 going to shut down the Navajo Generating Station. It's one of those 27 coal-fired power plants on the Colorado Plateau that I was telling you about. It sits on the Navajo Nation. Between the power plant and the mine, it will put 800 members of the Navajo Nation out of work and it will create a hole in their budget, the nation's budget, of $40 million a year. <coughs> the, complex, the human complexities of these transitions are real. It creates politics that are real, and we have to think ahead about how do we manage those complexities. <clears throat> but I don't want to leave you with a depressing talk. I want to be optimistic about this. The opportunity in front of us to create a better future for everybody is very real. Infrastructure investments, as I showed in that, the earlier slides, have done wonderful things and will continue to do wonderful things if we design them well. That's why we spent the first half of this week trying to figure out how do we bring electricity to the billion people on the planet who don't currently have it. Because finally, thanks to price declines in the renewable energy sector, we have a technology that's distributed that we can bring to rural and remote communities for cheaper than we can build grid lines. And the cost of grid extension, right? This is why farms in America in the 1930s didn't have electricity. The cost of building those power lines was too expensive to justify economically. And that's why those folks today in rural and remote areas of the developing world don't have electricity. It's too expensive to build grid lines. We have a technology now that we can build energy and deliver it to them. <coughs> but we also know that there are lots of challenges with that. Challenges that have to do with how do you design those systems so that you actually create social and economic value out of those projects. So that when you put solar panels into a community in two years, they're still running because somebody knows how to repair that system, right? There are all kinds of dimensions of this that we have to work out and that's what we were working on. But the opportunity to upgrade the human condition worldwide through new energy investments is significant. We have to think about it, right? And so the question is, how do we get that societal return on investment from energy innovation? And then my question that I want to focus on for the rest of the conversation is, what are we going to build when we do it, right? What are the choices that we have in front of us? And what are we going to build? So we are often faced with this choice. And it is a false choice, right? As if this is the only design question we need to ask. Do we build, do we continue to rely on a carbon-based infrastructure? Do we build a new kind of energy infrastructure? That's the only sort of choice that people are typically confronted with. What we're doing in Arizona is we're conducting a giant experiment on the future of solar energy. So all of these technologies look the same. They all look like solar photovoltaic panels. But they're not. I mean, they all are PV panels, yeah, and they're all basically the same technology. 
although we're finding some subtle differences. But each of these pictures represents a fundamentally different design for a photovoltaic market. People don't like to talk about market design, but it's a reality. <coughs> Each of these technologies configures the relationship between financial investors, owners, operators, in different ways. And they're all thriving in Arizona at the moment. What I want to suggest, and I'll come back to, is that if you play out these different markets to the scale of powering humanity, you get very different worlds out the other end. And that's the design choice that confronts us. So how do we think about those choices? I mean, this plant here is out in the middle of the desert. It's an enormous solar field, a couple hundred megawatts worth of solar panels. It's owned by the electric utility. That one up in the upper right hand corner is a community scale project. It's owned by the city of Marana, a suburb of Tucson. And they rent out panels to people who live in the community who then get the benefit of that energy. Uh, you know, this is Macy's commercial establishment, they own those panels, or probably actually in that context, uh, they contract with a company like NRG or somebody else who's built it and, and operates that power plant for them as a third party power plant and they have a long term power purchase agreement. <coughs> we have this thanks to the uh, Recovery Act of 2009. Um, and of course, we have lots of neighborhoods with lots of solar panels on individual rooftops, which is actually two separate markets, two separate market designs. In one of them, you have individual homeowners <coughs> who own their own energy assets, produce their own energy, and sell any excess back to the utility grid. In the other one, so half those panels up there in that upper right are probably owned by the individual homeowners. The other half are owned by Elon Musk in a bid to become the largest electric utility on the planet, owning people's rooftops. Fundamentally different futures between Arizona libertarians who love solar panels on their own roofs, who love not to have to be subject to a regulated monopoly utility company, right? On the one hand, and the largest electric utility on the planet, which is what Elon Musk wants to build. A single company that owns panels on rooftops, millions of rooftops all across the United States. Fundamentally different political economies, if you will, in those two different futures. So when we look at solar panels, and we think about the design of different ways you can put solar panels into society and into the marketplace. You get different revenue streams, different ownership models, different environmental impacts, different regulatory frameworks, different aesthetics, different distributions of risk. Right? This is a huge design problem that we should be thinking about ahead of time. Here's just one example of, the, uh, of those differences uh, played out with respect to how an individual household's budget <coughs> would respond to putting solar panels on the roofs. Actually, it's two examples. This is Arizona and this is Michigan. And so in Arizona, this particular website, Solar Power Rocks, <coughs> is saying the best option financially for the individual in question is to take out a solar loan for a five kilowatt solar system. And those are the sort of net balances with a net present value of $5,800 over the 20 years of that purchase. 
The second best solution is to buy that solar, buy those solar panels outright. You start off negative because you have to dip into your savings account. Fortunately, we got lots of retirees who retired to Arizona with fairly big bank accounts who are on fixed incomes, who want to control their costs. And so they're buying solar like mad because it fixes their energy costs over the next 20 years. But you dip into your savings account, but then you build over time. And so if you look at the net savings, it's actually bigger. It's $20,000 versus $15,000 if you take out the loan. So you actually save more money in the end, but the distribution over time means that if you're an economist and you calculate net present value, it comes out less. I don't entirely understand that, but it's the nature of the game. <coughs> In Michigan, the same website tells you two, a different answer about what's best for you financially in terms of a bill. You should, in, in Michigan, it says you should do a power purchase agreement. So you should, you should go with Elon Musk. You should let him build the system, put it on your rooftop, and then you can uh, pay lower energy bills over the course of the next 20, 20 years. You'll save money. You won't save as much. You'll save about $4,000 because there's not as much sunlight uh, in Michigan. <coughs> Given that the cost of a uh, five kilowatt system is something like $15,000 at the moment um, without subsidies, you know, you can see where we're beginning to, why in Arizona we're beginning to play into this because you're saving that much money. Uh, whereas it's, it's more complicated in Michigan. Um, <coughs> so we've got choices about how we go forward if all we're thinking about is, if, if even all we're thinking about is solar energy. Um, but that's not our only choice that we get to make. So we have this question, who's going to own and drive the cars of the future? <coughs> and are they going to be electric or internal combustion? Um, the, the automobile sector at the moment is dealing with three fundamental transformations that could potentially embroil it all at once. Right? So there's the electric vehicle question. Uh, there's the question of whether we're going to let robots drive us around. Uh, which I will tell you is live in Tempe, Arizona. We are the world center for the testing of automobile, of driverless automobiles. My neighborhood routinely has Waymo Pacifica Chrysler vans driving around by themselves because I live about half a mile from Intel's power plant, we, or major facility, not power plant. Uh, and we learned about a month ago that Intel and Google have been collaborating for the last seven years to build driverless vehicles. Um, so yeah, they picked my neighborhood to do this in. <laughs> I love it. They drive by my son's school every day. I'm like, really? But anyways, um, so aut autonomy, electric vehicles, and the third, of course, uh, related to autonomy is the question of whether we're gonna own our own vehicles or whether Uber is gonna own them all as a giant fleet and do transport what's called transportation as a service so we just bought we just rent a car for the 10 minutes to get to work if we need one right and so lots going on in the transportation sector in the next 20 years and then of course this was announced the other day too there are folks who want to fly us right fill our skies with private taxis uh, robotically driven running us around, so we'll see. Um, you may not have known this. Electric vehicles have about one in 10, about 10% 10 of the number of parts that an internal combustion engine vehicle has. This is great if you're the owner of that vehicle because it means your repair bills will be minuscule over the life of that vehicle compared to an internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, but if you're Napa Auto Parts, if you're the local auto mechanic, this is maybe not such a good idea. We're talking to the Tempe Chamber of Commerce uh, about this. Ch 
challenge. There are about 200 small businesses in Tempe, Arizona alone that are dependent on auto repair, auto service for their livelihoods, right? So these are, again, to come back to my main point, we have these choices in front of us and they are real choices that create real challenges for how we think about what kinds of futures uh, we want to go to. I'm almost finished here. Um, scientists and engineers want to make your home smart. They want to take Siri and put it into your wall, put her into your walls so she can talk to you, she can run your energy system, she can you know, do all kinds of cool things. We've estimated that that will run something like $75 to $100,000 per house to do a full upgrade to a smart energy system in the home. So then there becomes a very real question about who will pay for that, who will have access to those technologies. They're phenomenal technologies in terms of saving money, integrating the house effectively into a new smart grid uh, system, et cetera. Uh, but also real questions about what does this mean for the inhabitants, right? So just as in that Richard Scarry picture, we went from you know, households without electricity to households full of electrical devices and everybody had to readjust. And we're still readjusting to the question of if everybody's on their phones at the dinner table, what does that mean, right? Do we ever talk to each other anymore, right? Um, so we're going to, those same kinds of social adjustments at the level of individual families are going to continue as part of this. What if, you know, mom and dad don't agree on what the temperature should be in the house? Uh, is Siri going to resolve that dispute? Who's going to, you know? I, I joke, but then again, I don't joke. Um, <laughs> We have to think about things like where our supply chains will run. Uh, this is a lithium mine in Chile. Fortunately, uh, most of this stuff that you're seeing just looks fancy. Um, the lithium mining is, is, by comparison to many forms of mining, extremely low toxicity chemicals uh, and so forth. But nonetheless, we're going to have to get a lot of it to meet the demand for batteries that are emerging both in the transportation sector and increasingly in the electricity sector uh, as well. A rough estimate of what it will take to power humanity 25 years from now is 25 terawatts. We're running about 15 terawatts right now. That's both electricity and fuel worldwide. <coughs> If you wanted to do that with just solar, and there's no particular reason to do that, but if you look at the amount of energy available from different kinds of renewable energy sources, solar is like 100 times bigger than anything else. It's a much larger resource than the wind, geothermal, any of these options. So if you just wanted to do it with solar energy, it'd be about 125,000 square miles of solar panels. <laughs> that means annually, if you assume a 25 year lifetime on those panels, these panels sit out in the Arizona sun all day. They get rained on. Uh, in other parts of the world, they get snowed on. Uh, they go from freezing temperatures to warm temperatures to freezing temperatures to what? I mean, this wears out solar panels. So 25 years is not an unreasonable lifetime for thinking about. That means 5,000 square miles of solar panels that we have to take apart and rebuild every year just to maintain that scale of operation. Right? So just to give you a scale size, that's Los Angeles. Right? It means rebuilding an area of solar panels for the world so it would be scattered out all over, right? But rebuilding that scale of infrastructure, recycling those panels so that we don't have a waste problem on our hands that dwarfs the electronic waste problem that we currently have in Asia from all of our computers, right? Uh, so, you know, these are real design questions and of course they're not just infrastructure design questions, they're 
questions about how we organize ourselves uh, as a human society. Um, it's about $69 trillion worth of investment, according to the International Energy Agency. Now, before you go too freaked out about that number, like, let me give you two context points. One is we're probably going to spend about $50 trillion just to produce enough oil in 2050 if we went that route to satisfy the global energy demand, right? So this is not radically different than what we will have to spend anyways because energy infrastructure just decays over time and it doesn't pr continue to produce electricity magically. So we, have, we are constantly spending money to rebuild our energy infrastructure no matter how we get our energy. The other I will tell you is that the uh, US fact book as of December for the world's economy says that there's $99 trillion sitting in bank accounts in cash worldwide. Right? So just to give you a little perspective, right? We could spend that money tomorrow to build this infrastructure. The cash is there not to do this, but it's a huge investment, right? And so that's, again, why I'm kind of articulating that we need to think about this as a design problem. This is not about where the money's gonna come from. This is about what are we gonna do with that money? It's the single most consequential act that we will undertake over the next 50 years is we will invest this money in building a clean energy infrastructure. So what kind of infrastructure and what kind of society are we going to build on top of it? It's not the only question that we confront around climate change, of course, right? We also confront the question of how are we going to rebuild our cities in order to address the vulnerabilities that have become abundantly clear. It, even if all we think about is Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, Maria, let alone the hundreds and thousands of smaller scale weather events that are causing havoc with our infrastructure, because our infrastructure worldwide was de designed, go talk to your engineers, they, it's designed for a particular pattern of weather statistics. And that pattern is changing over time. And so our city infrastructure is increasingly badly designed for the coming weather patterns that it's going to confront. And so not only do the engineers have to change how they think about things, and we've been having conversations about that, but it turns out most of the design standards are set in city law. Every city in America has a law on the books that says you must design your future infrastructure to this set of standards. And none of those standards have been updated to account for the fact that our weather patterns are changing on us. <coughs> so we're going to have to design uh, new urban infrastructures or part of this conversation may end up being about moving people. The city of San Juan yesterday announced that they, there are areas where they will not allow people to rebuild, full stop, because they're too vulnerable to future storms. That is a huge decision for a city to make, as you can imagine. The city of Boulder made that decision 10 years ago around a floodplain uh, widening plan for the city of Boulder, because they too were having floods that were routinely washing out their downtown. These are, these are big, big sort of policy decisions. Um, we may have to think about this for ecosystems as well, because ecosystems are also designed by nature, not by us, for particular weather patterns, particular statistical patterns. So um, we're going to spend a lot of money. The key question is, what are we going to get? What kind of a society do we want to build? So I want to get us to stop talking about all the other aspects of these problems that we've been talking about and start talking about where are we going? Where are we taking ourselves? What kinds of futures do we want to build? How do we build those futures so that we maximize the return on investment that we get for our future 
societies for our children, for our grandchildren, uh, so that we spend that money wisely as we're doing this infrastructure rebuild that climate change is now prompting us to think about. So thank you very much. Okay, we um, are running just a little bit uh, behind at this point, but I think we do have a few minutes for some questions for Dr. Miller. Um, Fortunately, I will invite my group to help. Yeah, yeah okay, and another group needs to go somewhere else, so let's, let's uh, not worry about that. That's fine. Yep. Um, are there any uh, questions for uh, for, for Paul? Okay, um, questions back here. Uh, yeah. Is the airline industry, commercial flights and transport, have they any direction in going towards electrical batteries or whatever for planes? Um, the airline industry is, um, a fairly small fraction of the world's fuel consumption. So let's just start with that as a basic uh, uh, foundation. But, uh, and, and it is a um, difficult proposition to do flying on batteries uh, because of the scale of energy consumption required uh, and the size of the airplane. So you need a, a certain amount of density of energy in order to do that, uh, to do flight. Um, there are uh, several very small electric uh, planes and uh, many of the companies, somewhere, no, nope. there, many of the companies that are talking about these kinds of uh, small of individual passenger drones or small passenger drones uh, for taxi service, et cetera, are in fact aiming to build electric uh, planes. But probably the solution for large scale commercial air transport uh, will be some combination of a renewable, some form of a renewably produced fuel. So you use the same kind of fuel that you're currently using. So a jet fuel uh, mix, but you figure out how to produce it renewably. So that could be you produce it through some sort of a bio process, or it could be that you create a carbon recycling uh, uh, project where you, uh, where you burn the fuel, but then you recapture the carbon out of the air and remake a fuel out of that carbon using solar energy. So there's a variety of different things that the airline industry is working on. Uh, to get to carbon neutrality. But proportionately, the airline industry doesn't use that much fuel compared to... No, not compared to uh, manufacturing and automobiles are the two largest sources of carbon by a long shot. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, Dr. Patton? Uh, I'd like to make a small correction. You refer to sunshine in Britain. Yeah. <laughs> As a Scotsman born and raised, it did shine once, I think. Nineteen sixty seven, June twenty third for coming back to uh what sure. is the yeah. what is the state of the discussion on public transportation? Public transportation. I mean we can't all have our own cars, right? Forever. Um so public depends on where you are. If you're in Europe you continue to see significant new investments in public transportation uh, infrastructures uh, uh, of various kinds. You see cities like London making it more and more difficult for individual passenger vehicles to operate within the uh, city confines. Um, uh, so that is certainly uh, on the table and I even see significant calls for it here uh, in the United States. Um, but the, the, there are political challenges of all sorts to making public transportation and economic challenges to making it work in the United States. Uh, and so we'll see where that 
sort of discussion goes. Um, what, when people talk about transportation as a service, meaning a company like Uber or Waymo or frankly General Motors or Ford in the future owning all of the vehicles instead of us individually owning all of the vehicles, the reason you would do that is a basic business argument. Most of our automobiles sit unused 22 hours a day. And that lack of use of that asset is a huge opportunity for squeezing additional revenue streams out of those assets. And so, uh, and so uh, transportation as a service begins to look more like a public transportation model, except it's not owned by the public. It looks like a more flexible version uh, of a public transportation option in which you're actually using your assets a significantly larger fraction of the time. The, the vision, and I don't know if you can make this work, but the vision is you drop the cost per mile by a factor of about a 10, of about 10. So uh, I did the calculation, if you assume a $25,000 vehicle, my household, or sorry, a 20, yeah, $25,000 vehicle. So a new Prius, for example, or a new Camry. 20 year lifetime, my household, two vehicles at a time, right? And you begin to add all that up. It amounts to over those uh, 20 years, a $75,000 expense. So the idea is that it would cost me one-tenth of that if we did transportation as a service and we got all the efficiencies worked into the system. And so that's how you could imagine getting people to get off of their individual vehicle, individually owned vehicles, uh, and, and onto <coughs> a service model. So that's what people are excited about in this country at the moment. Um, one of the things that I didn't talk about, but that's very real, uh, is that the cities we built in the 20th century were not terribly dense in this country. Uh, and the consequence of that is that public transportation is very difficult in the current form, right? Subway lines or, or train tracks. It's very difficult to justify financially in terms of ridership without large public subsidies. Now, that doesn't mean you can't give them large public sub subsidies and make them work. You can. But you've got to have the political will to do that. And we seem, at least for the moment, to be going backwards in terms of political will for large public expenditures in this country. Um, but the question of what the future of the urban landscape is going to look like is part and parcel of this conversation. We spent the 20th century going outwards. There's no guarantee that we will spend the 21st century continuing that trend. Uh, we see huge interest on the part of young folks in resettling urban centers, in, in living lives without automobile ownership, uh, for example. And so, uh, the, they're, they're, and, and when you add into that the rise of, an, of a new set of industries like Uber and Lyft and, and those kinds of, of industries that can service that kind of market and make it doable, uh, you create the potential for people to make choices that fundamentally reshape what our urban infrastructure looks like 100 years from now. I think the challenge that we've got is that we're used to thinking about urban infrastructure design as in what are we going to do this year or next year or in the next 10 years. And so we've got to start with what we've got and incrementally adjust it. And I think we need to think, the Chinese are very clear on this, they're thinking 50 years ahead as they're building new cities. And I think we need to get a little bit more thought thinking out in those long-term uh, trajectories as well. But not from a standpoint of central planning, 
right, where an engineer sits down and figures out what they think the city should look like 50 years from now. But in terms of our public conversation, what kinds of cities do we want to live in? How do we want them to be organized 25, 50 years from now, at where we have the scope to kind of make significant uh, changes? These will not be easy conversations to have. But the alternative is to do what we've done to the coal industry in this country, right? To just pretend that these conversations don't need to happen, to pretend that we're gonna continue to burn coal forever and ever and ever, uh, and then destroy communities because we've made no preparations whatsoever for the kinds of changes that are happening in our infrastructure system. Well, I think in the interest of time, uh, we'll stop there. Thank you. Once you bet. Um, Thank you all. Have, uh,